All right, so thanks to everyone for joining this webinar today on your rights in a pandemic. I'm just going to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, which will be different for everyone depending on where you're located, um, whose sovereignty was never ceded. I'm currently on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I want to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people attending today's webinar. We are meeting on stolen land and the laws we discuss today are colonial laws. The issues we're going to discuss today are intimately connected to the ongoing violence of colonisation. And I just also want to acknowledge the work of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations and advocates against colonial violence, particularly in the criminal justice system and during this pandemic. So the topic for today's panel is your rights in a pandemic with the focus of the policing of the COVID-19 restrictions. Uh, most of the session will be a moderated discussion and we'll be providing general legal information on this session, but not legal advice. We'll provide information about where you can go to for free legal advice if you do need it on this topic. To ask questions, please ask them through the chat and we'll try to get to as many as possible. We've also received questions through the Eventbrite registration, so we'll go through those before we get to the chat ones. Um, please keep your video switched off throughout the session. And um, just before we begin, I just want to acknowledge and thank my colleague Sophie Lestrange, who's helped to organise this event, and also the Victoria Law Foundation for hosting Law Week and for having us as part of it, particularly Lisa and Mick, who've helped organise today's session. Um, we're very excited to have three great panellists today. The first is Paul Kidd. Um, Paul's a lawyer at Fitzroy Legal Service. He's been actively involved in the campaign against HIV criminalisation for more than a decade. He completed his honours thesis on criminal endangerment and HIV in 2016, for which he received the Victorian Supreme Court Exhibition Prize. He's a member of the supervisory board of the HIV Justice Network in the Netherlands and director of Thorn Harbour Health. He's undertaking postgraduate studies at Monash Law School. We've also got Samantha Sauerlein. Sam is a principal, a principal lawyer of, Ju at, of Justice Connect's Homeless Law Program and leads Homeless Law's criminalisation and prison work. Samantha has also been working in the community legal sector for over 15 years. And prior to working at Justice Connect, Samantha managed the Homeless Persons Legal Service in Sydney, um, set up the Mental Health Legal Centre's Inside Access Project and worked as a lawyer with Victoria Legal Aid and the ASRC. We've also got Daniel Nguyen. Daniel is an advocate coordinator at Flemington Kensington Community Legal Centre, working as part of the Police Accountability Project campaign to bring an end to racially discriminatory uh, policing in Victoria. Daniel is also a director with the PLEA Project, a program delivering legal education in Victorian prisons and the Young Worker Centre, a CLC specialising in youth employment law matters. I'm now going to hand over to Paul, who's going to provide a short overview to start the session off before we move to the Q&A format. Thanks, Odette, and uh, thanks to everyone for coming along today. It's very exciting to talk about public health law. It's an area of law that most people don't really know much about. Most lawyers also don't know much about, but it's been very much in the news uh, due to this uh, pandemic. And I'm coming to you today from Jar Jar Rong country in uh, central Victoria. So I acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land. So um, what we're going to be doing today, as Odette said, we'll be going to a Q&A format, but I'm initially just going to go through and set the scene a bit with uh, uh, an outline of what the public health law in Victoria is, in particular the law that uh, we're talking about today, uh, which is the uh, stay at home directions and the criminal prosecutions that are being um, generated out of that. So as I say, this is an area of law that most people really know very little about. It's always there. It's actually a very old form of law. The quarantine laws uh, in various forms go back to ancient times. Uh, but it's, uh, it's an area of, of law that becomes very prominent during times of health emergency, uh, such as the one that we're going through now. And it's an area of law that can be very coercive in its operation and can be very, very extensive, quite surprisingly extensive, I think, for, for many people. Uh, I'm going to go through uh, what the basis of the law is and a brief outline of what your rights are in the event that you do encounter the police in relation to these laws and, uh, and what your options are in the event that you get a fine. Um, and we'll be then moving on to a broader discussion about these laws. And in particular, we want to talk about the ways they've had an impact on people's human, civil and political rights uh, during this uh, health emergency. So the, the law that uh, 
is the basis of uh, the current uh, wave of criminalisation uh, is the Public Health and Wellbeing Act. Um, that's a law that's been in place for some time uh, and it replaces previous versions. The Health Act 1958 was the, the, the law before that. The objective of that law is to protect public health, as the name suggests, and uh, in the wording of the Act, to achieve the highest attainable standards of public health and wellbeing. And it's an act that covers a whole lot of different areas of public health and wellbeing for Victoria. So this is the law that controls, you know, restaurant uh, hygiene and it controls, you know, inspections of air conditioning, cooling towers and outbreaks of various diseases and, and vermin and all sorts of, of areas are covered by this, this uh, law. Um, in particular, the law creates uh, an, a statutory office, the Office of Chief Health Officer of Victoria. The current occupant of that office is Professor Sutton. Uh, and, it's, and it's this act that gives Professor Sutton his powers uh, as Chief Health Officer. Um, the law includes uh, very specific air, uh, provisions in relation to management of infectious diseases um, and microorganisms and medical conditions. That's an area of the law I've got a long association with through my work in the HIV sector. And that's the area of the law that's uh, been uh, often used to control people with HIV uh, in this state. Um, the Chief Health Officer, because of that law, has a whole range of different powers, including some powers, the public health risk powers, that are there all of the time and which, which enable him to do things like close down restaurants or, or um, you know, respond to uh, minor health problems as they arise. But it also includes these emergency powers. These powers only exist during a time when they declared public health emergency in Victoria. Um, the current public health emergency that's been declared in Victoria is the first one that's been declared under this Act, uh, and it's the first one that's been declared uh, in living memory. Uh, I don't believe anything was, uh, there's been a public health emergency declaration for at least 60 or 70 years and maybe longer in Victoria. So the situation we're in, where there is a declared state of emergency, is very unusual and almost unprecedented. It's certainly unprecedented in all of our memories. Uh, and during that period of emergency, uh, once the Minister for Health declares a state of an emergency, which she did in March, uh, then the powers that the Chief Health Officer has under the Act, they expand quite radically. Uh, and they include powers to uh, put people into detention, to restrict people's movements, prevent people coming and going into the area where the emergency is declared and the current emergency covers the whole of Victoria uh, and a very broad power to do whatever else uh, the Chief Health Officer considers to be reasonably necessary to protect the health of the public. Um, so those are powers that most lawyers and most legal activists would see as very, very extensive and quite extraordinary. Uh, the power in particular to detain people uh, is in, uh, a power that normally only the courts have. Uh, so it's a, um, a very, very extensive power that very substantially curtails people's liberties and people's rights when it's exercised. Um, under the Act, the Chief Health Officer has the power to make certain declarations, and we'll come to those in a second. Uh, but importantly for our purposes, it's against the law not to comply with the Chief Health Officer's direction. Uh, and the maximum penalty for that is a fine. The amount of fine depends on whether the person being fined is an individual or a corporation. There's one defence that's in the Act for, um, the, for this. Uh, it's the defence of having a reasonable excuse for refusing or failing to comply. Uh, because, these, uh, because this offence has never been really used in the lifetime of this Act, we don't have a lot of judicial consideration of what all these words mean. So there's a lot of debate about whether, um, the, uh, you know, whose responsibility it is to demonstrate whether the person didn't have a reasonable excuse for complying. Uh, these, are, these are areas of the law that are still very new, even though the Act's been around for a while. Um, since the 28th of March, the government's uh, added uh, an infringement uh, notice offence uh, for breaching the Act. So this is the offence that has generally been used, uh, where p police have the power to give an infringement notice, that's a ticket or a fine, 
to someone who does comply with the Chief Health Officer's directions. And the amount of that infringement notice is a fixed amount, it's $1,622, so it's quite a substantial fine. We know that as of uh, a few days ago, the police have issued 5,604 of these infringement notices. So more than 100 times a day, people are being given a fine by police uh, for breaching these directions. And, in, and we know anecdotally that a lot of the people getting those fines are people uh, who, uh, who tend to come to the attention of police, uh, vulnerable groups such as uh, Indigenous people, uh, homeless people, um, people from migrant com communities and those uh, with mental health conditions or who use uh, drugs. Um, so, um, and what we, what we kind of don't know uh, is what the behaviours are that people have been accused of. Uh, to the degree to which people are flagrantly breaching the conditions uh, versus uh, many reported cases of people essentially doing normal, everyday, trivial things uh, and finding themselves fined for them. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the basis of all this is uh, a series of directions that have been formally made uh, by the Deputy Chief Health Officer under the and the two that we're most interested in are the restricted activity directions and those apply to businesses. Uh, and those are the directions that mean that churches and uh, sporting facilities, et cetera, have to be closed for the time being. <coughs> it's a very uh, ironic thing to be having a cough during a uh, presentation about COVID-19. Um, the more important one, the one that most people are coming up against is the stay home direction. And that's a really extraordinary uh, circumstance that we find ourselves uh, living in a society where it's essentially against the law to leave your own home unless you, uh, unless you have a reasonable excuse. And the direction sets out a series of exceptions, and I think most people would be familiar with those. Important thing about this is that these directions have changed seven times in the time that they've been in force. Uh, there are minor differences between them. There's some uncertainty about them. So, uh, since the 12th of May, some things have been permitted which weren't previously permitted. There have been changes. Um, that's been reflected, I think, in some uncertainty by the police about what's allowed and what's not allowed. And that, I think, has generated some of the fines that have been reported in the media and that there's been some commentary about. And there are other directions that, that cover some other situations. So it's not just those two sets of directions. One of our main concerns as community lawyers is about the way these uh, laws are being enforced uh, and about the way that people's behaviour is being policed. Uh, we know that uh, early in, in late March, the Victoria Police established a special uh, 500 squad uh, task force called the Operation Sentinel. And that task force uh, is a very large number of police who are involved in policing these laws. Uh, additionally, there have been 200 pr uh, protective services officers who normally patrol trains who have been redeployed uh, uh, to uh, enforce these laws. As far as we're aware, the police haven't got any training about public health. They don't understand disease transmission. Uh, they're, they're just there to enforce the law. So um, that leads to some arbitrariness in the way that the laws have been applied. Uh, and from the very beginning, we've heard stories of police being heavy handed about inconsistency in the way the laws applied and about police failing to use their discretion uh, and finding people for often very trivial uh, type breaches of these um, uh, directions that carry no real risk to anybody's uh, well-being or health. The other issue that I think is very concerning is that while these directions are in operation, the police essentially have a valid reason to stop anyone who's outside their home and challenge them about the reasons why they're outside their home. We've certainly heard of cases where people have been searched for drugs or, or for weapons uh, following for initially being stopped for COVID-19. That's very disturbing because that, is a, that, even though it doesn't formally extend what the, the powers that the police have, it does create an opportunity for police to stop people and challenge them uh, in a way that they didn't have before. So your rights in the event that the police do come uh, up to you are uh, summarised on this slide. Um, the police do have the power, if they think you've broken the law, to ask you for your name and address and you do have to give it to them. The police can certainly ask you the reason why you're out of the house, but you've got no obligation to tell them uh, you have the right to silence in that regard. Um, in some situations, the police can arrest you 
uh, but in most cases, uh, if they think you've broken the law, they're going to uh, issue an infringement notice. It's also possible for them to charge uh, people on summons for these offences. Important thing that everybody should be aware is that you do not have an obligation to tell the police anything uh, other than your name and address in a situation like this. You do not have to explain to the police why you're out of the house, but acknowledging that the police may choose to fine you if you don't give an explanation. So it's a matter uh, of judgment about whether or not you want to talk to the police about that or not. And you certainly don't have to consent to being searched. Uh, if the police say they want to search you for drugs or weapons, they need to have the legal right to do that. Um, if you do get a fine, uh, the uh, police might give you an infringement notice on the spot or you might get one in the mail. Um, whether you get a fine or not, we would really encourage everyone who deals with the police over these laws to go to COVID, covidpolicing.org.au and make a, uh, record, uh, make a report there. Um, if, you get, if you do get a fine, you can get legal advice. There's lots of services that are set up, uh, including our Fitzroy Legal Service dedicated phone line. Um, there are various options that can be uh, activated in terms of responding to these fines. Uh, and, they, uh, and they're summarised there on the slide. But as I say, your particular circumstances, if you've got one of these fines, means that you should get legal advice that's specific to you. And the most important thing, is if you get one of these fines, don't just ignore it. It won't go away uh, it's, uh, and, it, and it will only get worse. So that's my summary and I'll uh, hand back to Odette. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for that great overview. So I'm gonna start just by asking some questions for the panel and then we'll go to some of the questions that have been submitted through Eventbrite. So, what do the panellists think in terms of whether we need police in order to keep our communities safe during a pandemic and what would need to be different in our society to maintain health and safety during a pandemic without such strong police enforcement? I'm happy to maybe take this one um, to begin with. Um, I think, again, when we're looking at um, the current situation we're in, we have to acknowledge that it is a public health emergency um, and, and first and foremost that any response has to be underpinned by a public health response. Um, so we're looking at sort of you know, issues around sort of harm reduction being sort of the key sort of principles that um, need to be enforced to ensure that sort of our community is safe in this period. So police really shouldn't be um, sort of the main point of call and nor should a criminal justice response be um, what we're after. So I think, you know, it's important we acknowledge that and everything sort of underpins itself from that. But again, you know, we know that when we look at um, the different ways, and I think we'll talk about the data a little bit later, is that there is no sort of consistency um, amongst the data, which is in any way suggested that the more punitive um, countries or states, such as Victoria being probably one of the most punitive states when it comes to policing of COVID, have been any better in terms of managing sort of the public contraction and the other issues that have, you know, stimulated from the health response. So I think first and foremost, again, public health harm reduction should be our key principle in any of this. Just to add to that, Daniel, we obviously agree with that. And I think from a perspective of a legal service that's working particularly with um, people experiencing homelessness, this is something that we're constantly um, concerned about, about enforcement-based responses where it's more appropriate to think about health-based or service-based responses. And I think the same applies in a public health pandemic. Um, I think we shouldn't take for granted, as Daniel said, that you know, in a lot of other jurisdictions, um, police haven't had the same um, enforcement response. So there's been more of an, an educative role or a health-based um, role for police. Um, and there really is no data to demonstrate that having a heavy handed enforcement approach um, does actually keep people safer in terms of public health principles. So I think there's bigger questions we also need to think about um, as we saw the announcement yesterday around um, the potential extension of the um, public safety officers um, in Victoria, the fact that there is likely to be more police, more PSOs and what that looks like in terms of um, Victoria and policing more generally. So I think there's some important questions there as well. Yeah, and on that question, oh, unless Paul, do you want to add anything to those responses? No, that's okay. 
So in terms of that uh, possible extension of PSOs being redeployed um, outside of public transport areas be beyond COVID-19, I'm interested in your thoughts more broadly on that. And I'm wondering if one of you could start for those who aren't familiar with the formal role of PSOs and what powers they currently have, if you could start with a brief overview of what they can do currently, um, what their role is or qualifications, and, and what it would mean for this redeployment to continue after COVID-19. I might go to um, Daniel for that one. Yeah, sure. Um in terms of um, PSOs and just in terms of terminology, public service officers are um, members of what we sort of deem in Victoria Police Force that is utilised in sort of public space management. And so specifically, I think where most people in Victoria would see them is often on sort of public transport um, platforms and train stations. And, and that sort of underpinning and the introduction of those um, officers has really been sort of established over the past sort of 10 years. Um, and it's really, and potentially, as you know, sort of Odette has mentioned, potentially will grow. Um, the, again, this is, I think, a very confusing sort of issue that most members of the public won't always be quite aware of, is that when we look at PSO officers and we look at police in terms of visually, they wear very similar uniforms, they act in very similar ways, they carry weapons, they have powers of arrest, are allowed to ask people questions and all that. So the difficulty um, that we're seeing is that we're looking at potentially an expansion of those powers um, from where they usually had sort of legislative powers in sort of public spaces into other areas. And we've already seen that perhaps during COVID as well, where they've been also deployed in areas like shopping centres in other public spaces as part of that response. And, and from my perspective, that is concerning and, and it's concerning in a few different ways. And I think the other panellists can probably share their experiences as well, is that when we look at the people that have come into our services, so here at sort of Flemington Kensington, um, we know that when it comes to PSO officers that we're seeing, again, a really racially biased approach, um, heavy handed misconduct we're seeing at public transport stations um, across a number of different areas. Um, and our concern though, is that if we are then to allow PSOs to continue to operate in other areas of public domains is that we don't see for any reason why this bias wouldn't continue into other public spaces. So what it ultimately does is just continues to marginalise um, some of those targeted communities. It expands those powers to a broader sort of members of the public and I think that's the concern we have at the moment. Yeah, I think you know one of the key concerns with PSOs is they don't have the training uh, that police have. Uh, we have enough concerns about the way that police go about uh, the business of policing without having less well-trained police deployed uh, into um, public spaces. And on that issue of uh, police targeting particular cohorts, we're getting quite a few questions both through Event Biden in the chat about data and I'm wondering if someone could talk to what data we don't have, what data we do have, um, what data we'd like and what it's showing. Yeah. Well, we, we know how many, uh, the number that I quoted before, uh, that was uh, revealed by the police to a parliamentary inquiry that's been sitting uh, this week. Um, we know that the police have, have given some like head, top line data about the numbers of infringements uh, being issued. Uh, what we don't know is where uh, those infringements are being issued. We don't know what, what people are receiving uh, those infringements and we don't know what uh, behaviours, alleged behaviours, uh, people have engaged in that have led to those infringements being issued. Uh, it is apparent that the police have recognised, uh, you know, reading between the lines, it looks like the police have recognised that they have um, over-egged the pudding here uh, with issuing so many fines. Um, there are reportedly now, there are procedures in place at Victoria Police where more senior police have to approve uh, before these infringements can be issued. Uh, so I think uh, reading uh, into that, the fact the police uh, themselves can see that this is not an appropriate 
use of our power, that these laws are there to protect people's public health and to help us to flatten the curve and minimise transmission of this virus. They're not simply there for police to use to criminalise people uh, who, for whatever reason, uh, are not following the letter of the law or not, not following what the police interpretation of uh, the requirements are. Um, obviously, there needs to be some uh, mechanisms in place to ensure that we do have a successful response to this public health crisis. Uh, but it's really, um, you know, it's a reflex action by government to tend to want to use the police and to use criminalisation as the tool to ensure that we do that. Uh, when in fact we know that people often act uh, very altruistically, act in their own interest and in the interest of the community when they understand what the reasons are, why we want people to stay at home, why we want to minimise uh, social contact. People were already minimising their social contact and staying at home before these laws were uh, activated. Uh, so, uh, you know, we know from the long history of public health and health promotion that what works in public health uh, is things like enabling environments, things like education, things like making people understand and feel connected to community, reducing the barriers uh, that people have to participation uh, in a community-based response uh, to the virus. Criminalisation didn't work for HIV, hasn't worked for other diseases, and there's no evidence that criminalisation has anything to do with the, the success we're having against COVID-19. Can I probably add here um, in terms of the data? And I think, you know, one of the problems that we have and when we're talking about sort of over policing and sort of discriminatory practices um, and particularly in the COVID environment is that, you know, it's the systemic structure nature of sort of Victorian police and sort of Australia police, which sort of has caused a lot of these issues to come to the forefront. And when we talk about data by way of example is that the sort of mandates and requirements of Victorian police to keep data um, so if, when we look at this example in this situation, whether it's sort of infringement data or when people are getting stopped, they're not required to keep um, and sort of publish and provide sort of transparent data around key demographic status, such as people's ages, people's perceived ethnicities, the areas that people have been um, potentially um, stopped and provide infringements with. There's no sort of ability for an independent look into that data to provide some of those trends. And without sort of this transparency and without some of that data, that's what sort of is the problem we have and it underpins that lack of transparency and the issues that occur. And so I guess when we, when we extrapolate that a little bit further and maybe just to provide sort of the people um, in the audience today with some of that key data, when we look at Victoria by way of example, you know, we're at over five and a half thousand fines. You know, if we culminate every other state, we're still ahead. You know, my understanding is New South Wales sitting at around sort of 13, 1400 fines at the moment. Um, New Queensland is slightly, um, there as well. And then other, every other state is miles behind in the hundreds. Um, and so when looking at that data, it's hard for us to be able to pinpoint as to why sort of Victoria is sort of leading that forefront within sort of, you know, the higher levels there. Um, but again, if we're looking at sort of, you know, again, we know, and again, our practices have shown that whenever there's data that's been produced on policing, it is discriminatory. It has higher sort of impacts within Indigenous communities. Um, targeted communities within sort of migrant ethnic communities. And we're seeing that across the world when it comes to COVID as well. And I think when we look at COVID related um, enforcements around the world where they actually do have to keep that data and they have to publish and, and be transparent about it, we're seeing that sort of skewed towards those communities. So I think I was looking online the other day um, and I've got it here as well, is that, you know, in the UK, for example, um, where sort of the population who identifies sort of um, black is around 3%. Um, currently, their fines are sitting at around 10%. When we go to sort of cities in New York, for example, um, I think I saw the other day that there's been 300 summons or arrests, um, 345 summons and arrests for COVID-related offences. 300 of those 345 are from African-American communities or Hispanic communities. So it's clear that whenever we are able to get data, we know that it is an issue. It's something that we do need here in Victoria and it's something that in across Australia is really important for us to continue fighting for. And just to add to that finally, I mean, from our perspective, I think it was clear from Paul's presentation that the thing is we don't have the data. So, you know, anecdotally, yes, we have concerns, but actually in practice, we haven't seen a huge flood, for instance, of people experiencing homelessness, receiving COVID fines. But I think what's important from our perspective that Daniel highlights as well is that it's data around in infringements and fines and charges, but we also want the data around 
basically contacts because one of the issues is obviously fines are one thing and it's very visible then if you've got a person who comes to you with a fine um, and if there's an issue around lawfulness it, it's arguable um, but if you've got people who are being you know frequently stopped um, by police there's real issues there around wanting data so that we can understand the impacts on particular communities um, and make sure that there's greater transparency really that's in you know for the benefit of Victoria but for police as well because it will restore at least some you know public faith um, that, that police are acting as they should in this public health emergency so I think there's benefits for everyone if that transparency is built in. And I think you just look at the fact that um, you know governments and sort of countries across the world when it comes to COVID and releasing statistics around transmissions and people that have passed away and areas of that, they're very transparent about all that data because they understand that it does sort of lead towards people trying to do the right thing. When they're hiding things, it becomes a bit slightly different story. And I think we sort of need to continue to sort of act on that. Sam, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more to what you're seeing at homeless law and, and also to the exceptions that are there for people experiencing homelessness and whether those are being upheld? Sure. Um, I mean, I think what we'd say is that generally, um, as many of you would know, I mean, the work that we do at Justice Connect Homeless Law is really working with people at risk or experiencing homelessness. And for the last 20 years, you know, the one of the main issues we've been helping people with is addressing fines and infringements that are pretty much directly related to their experience of homelessness. Um, and the reason, of course, is as you know, would be evident to everyone here, I think people who are experiencing homelessness are obviously at more risk of receiving fines and charges um, for what we call public space offences. So really things like you know, being drunk in public, tickets on public transport, um, basically because you're more visible to enforcement. Um, and it also means that you're less likely to navigate the justice system and the fine system um, to deal with those fines and charges. Um, so that's always been the work that we've done. And I think, you know, from very early on, we identified that that is an issue in terms of um, disproportionate impact of policing. Um, and so obviously with COVID and with increased powers, but also with more um, offences on the books effectively, um, we were very concerned about how that would impact on our clients. Um, I think there's interestingly two things to say about that. As you mentioned, Odette, there is obviously um, an exemption in the public health direction around the stay at home order. So if you do not have um, an ordinary place of residence, then you are exempted from the stay at home direction. Um, so technically what that means is that if you are experiencing homelessness um, and you don't have a place to reside, then you shouldn't be getting fined under that direction. Um, but what is an exception is that a lot of people who have been sleeping rough, um, particularly in the CBD, but generally have been put up in temporary um, accommodation, often in hotels, which is great that there's been a response recognising that people um, need to be housed, particularly during a public health pandemic. Um, but in the public health directions, what that means is if you're in some sort of hotel accommodation, um, that's considered to be your ordinary place of residence. So many people who have been experiencing primary homelessness have now been put up in hotel accommodation um, but they potentially are at risk of getting those fines if they're seen to be not residing in those places but you can imagine if you're staying in a hotel in a quite small room there's more reason why people might be out um, and once again more visible so um, that's what we're facing at the moment i think is the risk of of people there's less people um, experiencing homelessness rough sleeping at the moment um, but certainly we know that there's going to be more visibility and I think, um, as I mentioned, our concern is obviously about fines and charges, but also about um, over policing really so that question of contact with police. Um, and one of the things that we've been um, calling for for a long time is about having better protocols for police um, in relation to people experiencing homelessness in public places, recognising that actually people do have the right to be in public places um, and that police don't necessarily need to be approaching unless someone actually is doing something that's a cause of concern or that breaches the law. Um, so that's something that we have been you know, keeping front and centre um, in the work that we do. And particularly at the moment, obviously, we're really wanting to um, keep that momentum going because more than ever, if there is going to be um, increased police on the streets um, and more powers available to police to fine and charge, um, there needs to be better transparency, but better frameworks for police to exercise those powers. Thanks for that. 
Sam, and I, I'm just wondering, following from that on the point of the, the issues with people getting fined where there would be an exemption or the fine is just inappropriate and shouldn't have been laid, then what, what's the one question we've had is what, what's the problem if people can just, you know, challenge that in court or have it withdrawn, then what's the problem with that fine being given in the first place? I mean, basically, one of the issues that we have is that we have a fine system and a justice system that's not actually that easy to navigate um, for anyone. And certainly for people that I think all of us at CLCs work for, um, it's not actually an easy process for people to deal with fines and with charges. So, um, as you say, there are options to deal with fines. So, I mean, just quickly, obviously, you do have options when you first get a fine in terms of either getting it internally reviewed. So if it's Victoria Police that have issued the fine, you can ask for a review with Victoria Police. And if you say that you um, had a valid reason for being um, for not being at home, then obviously you could use that as an opportunity to put that forward. Um, you could also ask for the matter to be referred to court um, and have it heard in court, although that's interesting at the moment because of the way the Magistrates Court um, is operating. So um, it might not be listed for some time. but. So there are options to deal with fines, obviously, once you receive them. But the issue is that those options are not straightforward. Um, a lot of the time, it's a really protracted process. Um, unfortunately, a lot of um, fines Victoria at the moment are the ones um, that you know enforce fines in Victoria. There's been huge issues with delays and backlogs at Fines Victoria and issues with their IT systems. So for people who get caught up in the fine system, it can be a really protracted process and incredibly stressful. So, you know, we're always talking about the need to prevent people from entering the system in the first place. It's a waste of resources. It's incredibly stressful for people. Um, and if people shouldn't be getting those fines in the first place, then we need to stop it at that point, rather than expecting then that individuals will be in a position to challenge fines and have to extricate themselves effectively from quite complex systems. And what are the implications if someone just does nothing if they get a fine? Basically, if you do nothing, what happens is it, it effectively ends up being registered with Fines Victoria for enforcement. So there's a period of time in which um, the enforcement agency, which will often be VicPol in this situation, will have. Um, and you can ask for an internal review. You can ask for a number of options, a payment plan, et cetera, directly with them. But if, they, if you don't do anything, it will get registered with Fines Victoria. Um, and under the new COVID laws, they have 12 months to register um, that infringement with Fines Victoria for enforcement. And then once Fines Victoria are enforcing that fine, basically you have a range of options, but each step of the way, um, another fee gets um, added to that fine and your options get more and more limited until eventually um, you'll, you will be arrested um, under an enforcement warrant um, and bailed to appear in court. So that's the kind of trajectory of a fine um, if you do nothing at all. Just on a point you mentioned before, we've had a question in the chat that's relevant um, to what's happening in the courts right now. And so someone's asked, contesting an infringement at the Magistrates Court is effectively impossible during this pandemic when the courts have postponed a large number of cases. Would it be possible for a person to elect to contest a fine and get it before the court quickly, i.e. in the next few weeks rather than in 2021 so that judicial oversight and precedent could be set? Oh, sorry. Um, it is possible if you're going to plead guilty uh, to get it dealt with uh, before the magistrate's court uh, pretty quickly, but uh, I suspect the circumstances that this question refer to are where you want to not plead guilty um, uh, because uh, obviously you've got the option to pay the fine through the normal infringement process. Um, the, only, the magistrate's court will only hear a plea of guilty at the moment and it will only hear a plea of guilty that is in written form at the moment for, for a summary only offence. Uh, it will take a long time before you have, get to have your day in court. You should definitely get legal advice though. Uh, it's uh, contesting the fine in court or even pleading guilty to the fine in court has some pros but it also has some cons. Uh, and depending on your personal circumstances, you should get some advice about whether that's the best option for you. Certainly, if you think you've got a defence and you think that you can defend the, the fine, uh, 
probably the first step is to ask for that internal review and put to the police in writing the reasons why you think you shouldn't have been fined in the first place. You may well get the fine withdrawn at that very early stage without ever having to go to court. One question we, we've had in sort of various forms, um, but going to the same point, I'm just going to read out the question that's been asked through Eventbrite. Can you exercise while carrying a protest sign? When will Dan Andrews declare that the community can now go out to protest? I fear this will be left um, too late. How can we protest now or at least soon? I'm happy to jump on that one because the answer is can you can you protest can you exercise with a process sign I don't know the answer to that and be cautious about uh, giving a yes or no answer to that um, ultimately um, the real question about whether or not you're guilty of these offences is a matter for the court the police can issue an infringement notice but issuing an infringement notice doesn't make you guilty it just means that you that you put you in a situation where you either have to pay a fine or get the court to decide uh, on your guilt. Uh, as I said in my presentation, these uh, laws are basically unlitigated. We, there's just no case law on which uh, to base any kind of legal opinion. So um, if you wanted to contest a fine on the basis that you know you were ex you're getting some exercise while you were walking around with a protest sign uh, then i get some legal advice about that because um, there are some risks associated associated with it but i don't think anyone's in a position to give a straight yes or no that's the situation where you'd be guilty or not guilty sam or daniel do you have any comments on that issue or other sort of the intersection of these rights and the uh, of these laws and the human rights charter and that issue of, of protest laws well it's interesting i'm just looking at some of the chat which is kind of fun i just this is the good news about doing things remotely is seeing everyone's input straight away but it sounds like there's been um, some protesting recently so yesterday's ntu action um, where police came and didn't issue fines so that's good news and that someone said that police advise that protesting is considered a recreational activity and therefore can be done in groups of 10 now. Interesting. I mean, yeah, like Paul, I wouldn't want to sort of comment on that situation of exercise with a protest sign. I think um, it's, it's hard to say, but I do think that there's really interesting human rights issues um, raised by these laws, particularly in relation to protesting. Um, and I think some people had some questions about human rights considerations. Obviously in Victoria, we're um, lucky we do have a Charter of Human Rights. What that means is that basically when um, government is making laws, but also when um, government, so people like Victoria Police, anyone who's considered to be um, a functional public authority, um, when they're making decisions, they have to basically balance um, people's human rights and they have to look at whether it's justifiable, necessary and proportionate. Um, so I think that there's really interesting questions, which obviously we don't have time for now um, to go into great detail, but about this issue of, you know, whether or not it, it is justifiable. I think obviously with the public health pandemic, um, I think it is, but whether or not it's proportionate um, in terms of some of the restrictions that there have been in relation to the protests um, around refugees um, recently, where a lot of people got fined in a car convoy. Um, so whether or not there's, you know, and at the moment, Protesting is not one of the exemptions in terms of staying at home, but interesting human rights considerations around whether or not it's proportionate um, for people to not even be able to organise political protests, for instance, where it's you know, socially distant, um, might be in a car and follows those requirements. Yeah, and we've, we've just had someone in the chat also put up a link um, for people that's got some extra reading on that topic, if people are interested. We're getting some questions about um, individual legal situations, and I think for those, we would um, direct people, very strongly encourage you to get legal advice if you're in that situation and to call one of those lines that were on the slide, which Paul, um, if anyone wants it again, maybe I'll get Paul to share that one one more time. <laughs> um, but today we won't be able to answer um, any questions about whether you should contest a fine or not in individual circumstances. Um, Daniel, did you have anything you wanted to add on that topic? No, I think I agree with both um, the other panels. Right. Great. Okay, I might go through a couple other of the a couple of the other questions that we've had through Eventbrite. Um, we've got 
a question from someone who's asked as workers, how can we advocate for fairer policing practices? I, I think that's a, that's a matter that's a political matter. I think that what we all need to do is to make sure that, we, that when we get to the end of this process, we don't get caught up in some kind of mass forgetting of what happened during this crisis. There is a real risk, uh, particularly with the announcement in relation to PSOs that's been uh, discussed here today, there's a real risk of some negative long-term outcomes coming out of this with fewer positive outcomes. Uh, so um, I think we need to continue to work with our political representatives and to continue to work as activists to highlight um, the fact that the, the use of the police uh, as a means of enforcing a public health response was uh, uh, ill-advised and it created problems and it's created uh, uh, injustices uh, for a lot of people in our society. And that goes to the fact that we are an over-policed society in the first place. There are too many cops. Uh, there are too many politicians who see uh, putting more cops on the beat as being the solution to every problem imaginable. Uh, and the reality is, uh, you know, what we need is a society that, uh, that where people uh, are educated, supported, and encouraged to uh, be collaborative in their response to health challenges rather than coerced into behaving in particular ways. I think um, following on from that, I think there's a really good opportunity here um, with respect to sort of a public um, campaign is that with sort of the COVID and the restrictions and the enforcements around that and whether it's Victoria or across sort of the countries that a significantly broader segment of our community for the first time have sort of faced what many people in our communities who are targeted daily have had when sort of doing day-to-day -day interactions within public space. So whether in terms of what sort of Sam said before with all the clients that she sees and sort of the homelessness and communities and whether it's sort of the work that we're doing here uh, at Flemken with sort of uh, migrant communities, young people, um, Indigenous communities, is that those types of communities have been targeted, you know, since day one. Um, and for the first time, we're seeing that sort of spread across, I guess, our whole um, communities. And I think it's about leveraging that and going, perhaps building from that and going for the first time, seeing if we can uh, give people a platform and particularly centre the voices um, of those targeted communities and continue on and ensure that when we get out of this COVID environment, it doesn't just go back to sort of how it was before. And that for the first time, utilising some of those shared experiences and building a campaign around that. And I guess a lot of that, and I think maybe to be a bit more specific also, is I think the two things that we're really emphasising um, is again sort of around that sort of data collection infringement, sort of stop data, ensuring that that's transparent, ensuring that can be um, critically and academically looked at. Also, I think we've talked a little bit about review systems, and, and I think that's another problem that we have within sort of our policing is that we don't have a truly independent review system. It's that when it comes to for perhaps police misconduct, a way of example, it's still police investigating police. And until we get a review system, which is truly independent, is prompt, is victim sort of centric, and actually has some mandate to be able to do something about that, we're probably not gonna get very far. So I think it's continuing that fight. Can I just add one thing, which is I think that for me, I see it as an important opportunity to also reflect on the kind of preventative responses that we want to have. And I think police, you know, are put in a position where they're often seen as first responders now on a range of social issues. So whether it's a public health pandemic, um, whether it's in relation to mental health, family violence. Um, and I think it's a real opportunity for us, um, yeah, as Daniel said, to coordinate and think about what are the alternatives to that? What are the, how do we create a preventative service-based response to these issues that doesn't rely on police and think about what we want the role of police to be. So I think, you know, a lot of police are being put in situations where they just don't, I mean, they're not in a, they don't have the expertise to deal with it. So we know that we've got a service system that is going to be more responsive and a whole range of other tools. So how can we, you know, be clear about the role of police and allow but more service and health-based response by having services that do have that expertise stepping in there. So I think it's always a tension about how much police are expected and kind of expand into those spaces. Um, and I think it's really about reinforcing, you know, where it is that it actually needs to be a different kind of response and what that looks like.
Those are all really valuable and important points. And I, I just want to ask one follow up question for you, Daniel, on um, the processes that are there for reviews. And we've got on Paul's slide, you know, one option for people is to make a complaint against the police. And I'm interested in all the panelists thoughts on this. Do you encourage people to make complaints against the police? What are the pros and cons in making a complaint? Yeah, I think it's really important um, in terms of if you do feel that police, um, if there's been police misconduct in whatever way that may be, and I think particularly though when there is perhaps criminal charges um, pending is to get legal advice. I think Paul sort of touched on it before is that there are so many intricacies when it comes to um, police complaints and investigations. Um, if I sort of speak a little bit more broadly um, with respect to what we're doing um, as part of our police accountability project is that we probably feel that sort of individual police complaints um, as part of um, is no longer sort of our main focus. Whilst um, there are potentially some wins that can be had there is that, again, we sort of go back to some of those problems that exist with the complaint system is that it is again, police investigating police. It isn't truly independent. There are some real difficulties with how long it takes um, and sort of information gathering, not having sort of victims um, being centered as part of that. So for us, um, we're looking at it from other ways and trying to address some of those systemic changes and whether it's sort of, you know, pursuing it through sort of civil matters, looking at a bit more advocacy, again, campaigning for some of those stops, um, is that that's sort of what where our focus is. Um, again, I think we'd obviously welcome and, you know, our, our details are there. If you do have issues, please get in contact and we'll look at that. Um, but I think the main thing, though, is that sort of individual complaints aren't going to be the main thing that's going to address this um, a systemic approach. I'm just conscious that we have quite a few questions to get through and not a lot of time left. I might throw to Sophie now to um, highlight some questions that we're getting from the chat. Yeah, um, lots of good ones coming in. There's been a few about supporting, supporting young people or people from cold communities with strategies in dealing with over-policing, but also in how they can access culturally appropriate or, and translated information about the laws and policies because there's a lot of confusion in the communities about what's the law and how do I follow it? I guess from our perspective, um, if you've got some young people, um, we have a peer advocates program um, which sort of, um, sort of builds in capacities and powers young people um, gives them a platform and a voice to uh, do a lot of this. So whether it's campaigning and addressing sort of systemic change, whether it's going out there in communities and providing legal education and information to um, various communities in a culturally competent way. Um, yeah, so if anyone sort of, I guess, in the chat has um, young people that, they're, that are sort of interested in this space, please get in contact. Our details are there. Just shoot me an email. Happy to have a chat. Yeah, this is a general challenge that we face uh, all of the time and it's particularly hard uh, to support uh, the people on the margins in this regard when we're, when we're trying to react very quickly to a suddenly changed legal uh, situation. So I acknowledge certainly that there isn't enough information out there. I would make the point that people who have language barriers may well have a reasonable excuse defence and they should get uh, legal uh, advice because obviously if you you weren't aware of or didn't understand the directions that's potentially uh, a defense if you got fined for breaking them but also potentially cultural reasons why people might have been out of uh, their homes and uh, uh, hassled by the police uh, uh, and those could also be areas that uh, that could be explored but uh, um, we try as much as we can at Fitzroy Legal Service to provide a uh, a, a service that's accessible to people with language uh, barriers and that's culturally competent, but it's always a challenge for us because we're all very small and, and minimally funded organisations. Uh, we do the best that, that we can and uh, at a time like this, it's, it's particularly challenging. And following on from that, um, there's another question related to that, which is, do the police need a higher standard of cultural competency and understanding and enforce, in enforcing and communicating the COVID-19 laws? Which I think goes to a, you know, the question of who's, who bears the onus for that? Is it the community sector representing those clients or is it the government and police who are responsible for, for making sure that information is accessible and understandable? I think the police have struggled to understand what their role is 
in all of this. Um, but the bottom line is the police are a tool and they're a, uh, a tool that is really there only to respond to social problems with one single response, which is to criminalise people. Um, what we really need is not just cultural competence within the police. We need to reform the whole institution of the police. We need to um, make the police more accountable, more representative of the community that they serve and uh, to cease to have the police operating uh, as, um, you know, controllers of people's behaviour in the way that they do using both violence and force as well as criminalisation as the tools for, um, for compelling people to behave in what individual police have decided, uh, rightly or wrongly, is the right way to behave. Yeah, and I think Paul's absolutely right. You know, it is about sort of reforming the system. But again, when we look at sort of what other states have done during COVID, like ACT by way of example, um, you know, police haven't issued a single fine there. Um, and they have sort of taken that approach of sort of educate and inform. Um, whilst I don't, you know, agree that they should be the main people doing that, I think it's a much broader campaign and sort of governments need to be a lot more proactive in sort of putting that messaging out and ensuring that there's culturally competent um, basic information that can be easily accessible. Because I think everyone can agree, anyone on this chat, um, whether it's the panellists or those that are participating through Zoom elsewhere, is that we've all been confused, and, you know, even as lawyers, even as legally trained people, as people, you know, very different fields that do this day to day, is I still don't know what my basic rights are walking around sometimes. And I think that therein lies the problem. And then also trying to criminalise the approach and have enforcement of policing being the key sort of cornerstone of any education program. I'm going to ask one quite specific question. Um, if the panellists have any experience with this or thoughts on whether how body worn camera footage is being used in the policing of fines. Um, can a person who's been fined access body worn camera footage um, or can their lawyer access it as well? I might start with Daniel on that one. Sure. Um, I did sort of speak to um, our um, police accountability principal lawyer on this issue and I think again it's a little bit unclear I think broadly speaking um, if there are criminal sort of indictable proceedings which is for serious matters um, that body worn um, camera is provided in seven days if it's a more general sort of criminal proceeding as part of any police brief it is I think that the, the clarity around this is the, di the difficulty is that we do know that if you do file a police complaint you have the ability to view that um, the body worn camera so if it's a police misconduct issue that that's available as a um, project we have previously attempted to file um, freedom of information um, documents to obtain the footage or obtain at least transcripts of um, body worn cameras and we have been told um, and rulings have been put forward that the freedom of information sees the body worn cameras as protected information and therefore not um, disclosable. So that's the current position that we have at the moment. Whether they can be applied in this case, I think, again, is very questionable um, and wouldn't be something you would rely on um, if you were looking at the defence. But I think, again, speak to your legal representative about that one. Okay, unless anyone has any quick comments on body-worn footage, we're almost out of time. So I'm just going to ask one final question to panellists, which is, if you had you know, one key thing that you want to see changed in terms of policing in Victoria um, post-COVID, or one key message that you want to you know, put out there for this webinar, for people watching afterwards, what, what would that be? I think the reiterated message, I think, from all of us has been around the need for better transparency and accountability. Um, so I think, you know, that that data piece is huge. So there is proper accountability and oversight. So I think that's, yeah, one big thing that we would say as well. I think from my end, again, it's sort of the reform agenda. Um, divesting away from policing and you know we only have to look in the past few years as to just the significant increase in police budgeting um, and also sort of correction facilities um, and ensuring that instead of that money going that way looking at sort of some of the issues that are underpinning it making sure that we do have um, you know access to housing access to health access to some of those basic um, rights that we're seeing is so important during the COVID um, epidemic that's necessary and ensuring that that's carried across um, our society into the future.
Yeah, I think Daniel referred earlier to the fact that there are some people who are finding themselves fined who haven't, aren't used to coming to the attention of the police. So, you know, if you're out playing golf and you got fined or you're having a barbecue in the park and you got fined and you feel like that was unreasonable and, uh, and unfair of the police to react it, well, you know, that's an insight into the daily reality for a lot of groups in uh, our society who are always coming to the attention of the police. Uh, and that's, uh, I think, an insight into the need for a form of policing as a whole across the whole of our society. Uh, to reduce uh, the police's power to, um, to, to hassle people on the street, to target vulnerable groups, uh, to reinforce the structural inequities that lead to people having uh, problems in the first place. Uh, those are insights that I hope some people will carry forward and see the, see the, um, the meaning behind uh, those of us who are calling for reform of policing, uh, that uh, in fact, the police often seem invisible and often seem like they're protecting our rights. Uh, but for a lot, of, a lot of groups in society, the police are constant, uh, constantly keep them under surveillance, constantly engaging with them, constantly criminalising them. Okay, we are bang on two o'clock, so I'm going to finish it there. Thank you very much to all the speakers. It's been a really great session. I've certainly learned a lot from hearing from all of you, so I hope everyone has learned something watching this. Um, thanks to everyone for participating and watching and for the great questions. Um, if you want, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to get in touch. Um, and yeah, please make sure you can write it down these resources on the slide as well. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Adette. Thanks.